We are in the oldest place on Earth. Its formation began 200 million years ago when the supercontinent Pangaea began to split apart. Since then, the devastating force of nature has constantly modeled it, sculpting the most beautiful forms in a never-ending work of creation. Guayana Massif in the south of Venezuela, along the Brazilian border, lies the largest, most intact virgin forest in the world. Hundreds of waterfalls, torrents and fast-flowing rivers and streams are the only clearings breaking up the lush vegetation of the jungle. They snake among the dense green canopy, crashing down from the spectacular rock formations, the sacred tepuis of the Indians, the dwelling place of the gods of the great savanna of Venezuela. This green world lost in time live men intimately adapted to their jungle environment, which though fascinating, is full of dangers. They are the inhabitants of the jungle who live alongside and respect the endless different life forms around them. Their culture is ancient, almost as ancient as the landscape in which it has developed. It is the scene of hunters and hunted. Drop your guard for just a single moment and the order is immediately reversed. The hunter can become the prey and the prey an implacable predator. But the king is always the tiger, the jaguar who is always on the lookout with its sinister gaze. Its roar silences the forest paralyzes the beat of life. The jungle does not regain its breath until His Majesty has collected his blood tribute. Here live Indians of different ethnic groups. Pemon, Makiritar, Panar and Hotis divided into an endless number of tribes. All of them and especially the Pemons Fear and respect the Tipuis, these table mountains that seem to have been carved by mighty beings, giants of the universe like those described in their mythology. Without a doubt, the most venerated Tipui of all is the Aoyan Tipui, the mountain of the devil in the Pemon language. They believe that up there live extraordinary beings, evil monsters and three-headed serpents. Down one of its faces crashes the Keri Pakubai Meru, also known as the Angel Falls, which is absolutely taboo for the natives. In their psychedelic trances, the shamans sing to warn their people. When you walk through the forest or sail along the river Churun, bow down your heads and be respectful. Do not look up, be cautious. On the Aoyan live cruel, perverse spirits who may not be observed. And if you have to go to the Devil's Canyon, your eyes should never see the great Kalapakubai Falls. Behind it live the most powerful of the gods. If you see them, they will immediately take your life.
You don't have to believe in the myths of the natives to recognize that this natural setting exercises its influence over us. The Aoyan is one of the most beautiful tepuis in Venezuela, a colossal rock formation that dramatically rises out of the dense forest vegetation, vertical walls over a thousand meters high. The waters of the rivers Churun and Carao are reddish and along the rapids become multicolored due to the effect of the foam. This coloring is due to the large quantity of tannin they contain. The disinfectant power of this substance means that the tea-colored water is fit for drinking. The Churun is a tributary of the Carao whose dark waters in turn flow into the cloudy brown alluvial waters of the Caroni, a tributary of the Orinoco. These rivers are difficult to navigate due to the many rapids and falls along them. In the dry season from December to June, the Churun runs almost dry, making travel along it impossible. Here, everything takes on colossal dimensions. The force of nature constantly manifests itself, creating an awe-inspiring atmosphere which for centuries has fired the imagination of the traveler and has given rise to all types of legends. Perhaps that is why Arthur Conan Doyle was inspired by Kanaima when he wrote the novel The Lost World. Rounding a tight bend in the river Churun, the mythical Geripakupai of the Pemons, the Angel Falls, appear. It is a spectacular sight, a unique landscape. It is not surprising that the first European travelers were profoundly moved by its very presence, and that it has been, since time immemorial, the home and the origin of the native pantheon. It is the highest waterfall in the world. The accumulated rainwaters of this part of the plateau crash down from a height of 972 meters, almost a kilometer. It is 17 times higher than the Niagara Falls. Flying over the Aoyan Tepoi, looking down at the walls of the Devil's Canyon, it does not surprise us that Arthur Conan Doyle should dream of dinosaurs inhabiting this lost world. On the 700 square kilometers of the Aoyan Tepoi, the vegetation and wildlife are different from those below. The Tepoi's are the remains of an enormous plateau which in the pre-Cambrian era occupied the entire region. The vegetable species that covered the ancient massif and part of its fauna have survived on the summits of these hills, isolated by the high vertical walls. After falling for almost a kilometer, the water crashes to the ground, forming rain and creating a ghostly atmosphere, 
giving the falls an ethereal dreamlike appearance. At dawn, the reflection of the first rays of sun produce a rainbow which adds even further to the spectacular image of what the Indians call Kiri Bakubai. The falls were seen for the first time by the Guayanan explorer Felix Cardona in 1927. Ten years later, the American pilot Jimmy Angel landed on the top of the Aoyan. He was looking for a gold mine, but the plane got bogged down in a swamp area and they had to descend on foot. After 15 days of hard struggle for survival, they arrived exhausted at the village of Uruyen. Since then, the Kiri Bakubai has been known as the Angel Falls. Did Jimmy Angel find the gold of the Aoyan? Some people say he did, and that one of his partners, the Latvian Alexander Laimel, kept it in secret. This mysterious figure dedicated his life to the Ayan Tupui, and even lived on its summit. What did this eccentric cartographer see on the Ayan Tupui? Laimel died some years ago without revealing his secrets. But to those of us who knew him, he spoke of mutants, of beings from another world who lived on the Aoyan, the sacred mountain of the Pemans. We are now flying south to the Makiritari village of Kanarakuni, the only clearing in the jungle for some 800 kilometers. An hour by canoe along the river Kanarakuni, we had our first encounter with the Sanema, a nomad group which had split off from the Yanomamis, the fierce people as they were unjustly named by the North American anthropologist Napoleon Jagnon. Though they and the Yamumami have common ancestors, the linguistic separation took place a long time ago, much earlier than that of French and Spanish, for example. Today, their languages are mutually unintelligible, though their customs are almost identical. The Sanema abandon their villages when hunting becomes scarce. They then move to a distant region where they can more easily capture their favorite prey, the dantos or tapirs and the vaqueiros, a type of wild pig smaller than the boar. The houses are large and open plan. On the walls, made of sticks and sometimes of mud, they place a covering of palm leaves. The fire is the central focus of the room. One side is used as a store for the food and the few utensils they own. In the rest of the space, they hang their hammocks in which they rest and sleep. Though they are hunters, they also grow some crops, essentially bananas and manioc, which along with the proteins they obtain from hunting and fishing make up their diet. The crop lands belong to the community. The women are in charge of growing and harvesting the crops. The manioc is a bush of the euphorbia family between one and two meters high, which develops very large roots in the form of fleshy tubers. They are very nutritious due to the quantity of starch they contain. Mm -hmm. 
The Sanama women are responsible for the majority of domestic tasks. They gather fruit and firewood in the forest, work the land, cook and look after the younger children. The men spend almost all their time hunting and occasionally fishing in the streams near the village. Once they have been dug up, the manioc roots are washed and grated using these graters with thin metal points. Some years ago, a DC-3 airplane crashed into the river just a short distance from the village. Since then, the Sanema have used the aluminium of its fuselage to make small metal tips for their graters. On occasions, their neighbors, the Makiritare or Yekuana, as they are also known, come here in their canoes to trade with the Sanema. They exchange plastic basins, machetes, graters, salt and red cloth for skins, smoked meat and dried fish. The tapioca, which is the product of grating the manioc, is placed in the seukan, a flexible basket which serves to squeeze out the liquid. Making the seukans, also called tinkis, is a job reserved exclusively for the old men, who meticulously carry out their work because they have the gift of patience. The juice of the manioc contains hydrocyanide acid, which is very poisonous, and that is why they have to extract it squeezing the tapioca in the seokan. By means of a kind of press which tenses the fiber, using a lever, the poison slowly seeps out. They are addicted to tobacco. Both men and women take on a fierce appearance as they place a thick wad of tobacco between the lower lip and the gums. More than the need to chew tobacco, this habit gives them the mineral salts that complement their diet. They dampen the tobacco leaves and smear them with ashes. Little by little, they shape this mixture until they obtain a solid ball which they place in their mouths. Like so many other things that are communal among the Sanema, the wards of tobacco are happily passed from mouth to mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Such is the lack of salt in their diet that sometimes, especially the pregnant women, become geophagists, that is, they eat soil. They dig into the seams along the riverbanks and swallow handfuls of earth. <laughs> When the press has extracted all the poisonous juice, the tapioca is ready to make the cassava, the bread of the jungle. The tapioca may be cooked and then wrapped in banana leaves or toasted on a metal sheet to make flat cassava loaves.
ಅದನ್ನ These men of the forest have the custom of decorating their bodies and faces before undertaking any action. Above all, they use red from the seed of the onoto and black which they obtain from burnt wood from a fire. Each sanama has a specific design which protects him. They generally represent totemic animals seen under the effects of the sakona or yopo, a powerful hallucinogenic substance they inhale through the nose. So <laughs> 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 The effects of the Sakona are almost immediate. Now the symbiosis with the magical dimension of the jungle is almost absolute. From their psychedelic vantage point, they can see the spirits of the jungle without being vulnerable to their influence and being united with their moresby, a part of the soul of this anima, which lives in a particular animal of the forest, making it his protector. <laughs> They frequently go on these journeys to the world of the spirits. Almost every day, the Sanema feel a need to transform into their totemic animals and visualize through its eyes the other reality of their existence. Under the protection of their ritual paintings, the hunting parties move deeper into the dense vegetation of the oldest primeval forest in the world. Along with the Amazon, it forms part of the largest lungs of the planet, a resource which belongs to all humanity and which we all have the obligation of preserving. The hunters remain immobile on the lookout, waiting for some prey to move in order to launch into attack. Quickly, the sounds return to the jungle. The animals regain confidence, are unaware of the presence of a superior intelligence which immediately interprets every noise they make. Man is out hunting, and even the jaguar king seeks refuge in the shadows of the jungle, unable to compete against the superiority of humans. area. They can be found near any river in the southern part of the Guiana Massif, mainly in the Kaura Basin. This powerful river, a tributary of the Orinoco, has many rapids and cataracts which makes it difficult to navigate and so for outsiders to penetrate into one of the least explored areas of Venezuela. Its waters are dangerous. The strong currents of the river form powerful whirlpools capable of swallowing a man. The 
hunting parties also take advantage of the night. This is when the jungle is at its most dangerous. The majority of predators hunt in the dark, including the terrible Mapanare, one of the most poisonous snakes in the world, whose bite is always fatal. But the Sanaman their way around this world they have dominated for over 3,000 years. Dawn is rising in Kananakuni. The fog lifts and the Sarisarinyama Tipui majestically appears. The young Yekwana Makiritare, the neighbors of the Sanema, are preparing their blowpipes. They make sticks with the dried stalks of palm leaves and plane them to form thin pointed darts around 15 centimeters in length. At the rear of the darts they roll fibers similar to cotton in texture of precisely the same thickness as the diameter of the blowpipe. When they blow the fibers receive the pressure of the air and the dart is launched at great speed. Here, everyone uses the resources provided by the forest vegetation. Before setting out to hunt, they must make the small darts poisonous. By themselves, they would be useless. They make incisions in the bark of a tree called tunare, and wait until an extremely poisonous orange resin oozes out. Then they dip the sharp tips of their darts in the viscous poison, turning them into the most efficient of weapons. Just a slight wound from one of these lethal darts could end the life of a man. They are expert mimics capable of imitating the songs of almost all the birds they know. They hunt all types of birds. For the Yekwana, everything that flies is edible. Their favorites are the tukuns and the mukors, the tongues of which they assure us are a real delicacy. Kuni, we fly over the Sarisarinama to Pui. Up there, the vegetation is just as down below, but this Te Pui contains an extraordinary phenomenon. Here is the largest crevice in the world, and the fourth in absolute depth. The surface of the plateau is scarred by deep crevices, and the largest crevices are formed by the collapse of sandstone rock. The largest is 352 meters across, 350 meters deep, and 502 meters in diameter at the bottom. There were
were formed by the collapse of enormous cavities of a sandstone rock. They have their own drainage system formed by watercourses that begin on the walls and edges and end by disappearing underground. Near to Seri Serinyama, the Kanarakuni and the Merivari come together to form the river Kaura. Its waters plunge down the Para Falls, one of the most spectacular cataracts in Venezuela, and a sacred place for the native Indians. Some relatives from the Ituku River have arrived at the Sanema village. The compulsory greetings are a real ritual. Two by two, they recite their respective family trees, which sometimes go back 20 generations. <laughs> Meanwhile, daily life continues at its slow, steady pace. The Sanema work just enough to eat and be comfortable in the village. They spend a lot of time doing nothing or playing simple, almost childish games. The arrival of visitors always breaks the monotony. They prepare dances, games and food for all. The warriors paint themselves with burnt wood as they do when they go into battle against other tribes. This is a very old custom, challenging outsiders, even if it is only in play. The Sanema have always been and always will be a warrior people. The visitors enter the village with their bows strung. There, other warriors await them. The tips of the arrows are wrapped in banana leaves so they will not wound anyone. This is merely a welcoming ritual. The Sanema believe that after the creation of the world, the gods fought a cruel battle in the stars. From the drops of blood that fell to earth, mixed with the dust, men were born. So they believe they came from violence, which could explain why war and confrontation in battle are so important for them. They are always on the alert, observing the jungle that surrounds them. Enemies always come through the jungle, this tangle of vegetation which here is especially dense. On the Guayana Plateau, the jungle grows on granite soil. The trees have had to develop both ground and aerial roots, and so there are parts of the forest which are virtually impenetrable. The shamans are the most respected people of all. It is their job to order the social behavior of the community, take charge of the worship of the spirits, and cure illnesses. They know the pharmacopoeia of the jungle and how to make medicines and powerful poisons.
It is also their responsibility to collect and prepare the Sakona or Yopo. They search in the jungle for the tree called Amahi. The bigger and older it is, the stronger will be the hallucinogenic substances obtained from it. First, they have to make a fire, which is not easy in the depths of the jungle, because the atmosphere is extremely humid and the wood, though it is not green, is soaking wet. They light it with a red-hot brand they have bought from the village. Though at times they manage to get matches from the Yeokwana, they always keep a fire lit in the village. When someone wants to light another fire, they take some of the embers. It has been like that since the beginning of time. The fire never goes out. There was always someone chosen by the Chaman, entrusted with the supreme mission of keeping it alive. There have even been wars over fire. When a group was left without their fire, they attacked another one in order to steal the embers. To extract the sakona, they tear off strips of the bark of the amahi, moisten them with saliva, and place them over the flame so they release the alkaloid. The wisdom of the shamans is the reason behind a new invasion of the jungle. First it was those who came in search of rubber, then later gold. Now the pharmaceutical laboratories have come to exploit the botanical knowledge of the shamans. They are less violent, they do not organize massacres of the Indians, but their presence and the objects they bring with them in order to negotiate upset the balance of the culture of these indigenous communities. They are the latest scourge to which the jungle has been subjected. The hallucinogenic resin forced out by the action of the heat is put into a pot and then cooked until it solidifies. The Sakona can be classified within the group of entheogenous indolic pharmaceuticals. They are only used ritually as in the case of other societies with peyote, ayahuasca, the San Pedro cactus, or in Central Africa, the iboga. Before returning to the village, one of the shamans tests the efficiency of the preparation. The visit is also a good excuse to go fishing, but first they will have to collect barbasco lianas. Once again they make use of their vast knowledge of their environment. The jungle provides everything they need, and hence the profound respect they feel towards it. This is where the spirits of their ancestors live, along with the others of the jungle itself. Every tree, every plant, every living being is the dwelling place of a spirit. And that is why every time they cut a tree or take something from the forest, the shamans have to ask their guards for permission.
They cut the barbasco lianas and crush them with wooden clubs so the sap will be more easily released when they submerge them in the river. These communities are self-sufficient. They belong to this land just as much as the jungle itself. They know no other world beyond the limit of the forest. They are happy with their deeply rooted customs, but there are still some zealots who come here to speak to them of the true gods of the West, to deprive them of their culture, to plunge them into confusion and bitterness. They are missionaries, especially those of some Protestant sects such as the New Tribes, who fervently seek to convert the infidels and cause authentic disasters with their ridiculous, outdated preaching. We have met Indians covered in fungal infections because one day some missionaries came to their community, were ashamed of their nakedness and so dressed them in sports shirts. But they didn't teach them how to wash the clothes, nor did they give them soap. Today they are not naked Indians, they are Indians dressed in rags and crawling with parasites. The sap of the Barbasco slowly clouds the transparent waters of the river. It's not a poison as such. It does not contaminate or leave residue. The Barbasco absorbs the oxygen of the water, and so the fish are forced to come to the surface to breathe. Then it is a simple matter to catch them. In a short while, the Barbasco is swept away by the current without any consequences for the river. Today wouldn't seem to be a good day for fishing. The fishermen stare down at the water, but the fish do not emerge. And to make matters worse, the sun has now given way to a storm, a very frequent occurrence at this latitude where the weather can change several times in a single day. In these Sanema villages, there is always a communal covered area where most of the social life of the group takes place. In the morning, it is customary for the Sanema women to gather here to paint their faces and bodies with clan or esoteric designs. Another of the usual communal activities is delousing. Almost constantly, the women comb through each other's hair in search of these tiny parasites. When they catch one, they kill it with their teeth and eat it. There's no accounting for taste. Like eye drops, the juice of this liana soothes the irritation in the child's eye. They know a thousand and one remedies for the ailments they suffer, but here illness has a religious significance, as the source lies in magic and spells. So, apart from the potions and ointments with which they treat the ill, the shamans must travel to the other world, the country of the spirits, to receive their advice. They are the only ones capable of undoing the spells. They have to ingest large doses of sakona, which makes them salivate profusely. The journey they must go on to find their gods and ask their questions is very long. The ritual chants and the rhythmic movements are efficient means of leaving their bodies, transcending to the world beyond, to open the door which allows their consciousness to enter a different reality.